Good Thursday, everyone. Alongside Eric Kane and Rob Lewis, I'm Austin Price for the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Blue Water Climate Control gets more referrals to their website from VolQuest than any other source to show their appreciation. VolQuest listeners get discounts on all services and repairs, which is really good because it's time to start turning on your air conditioning unit. And unfortunately, it might not work, work like it normally should. When that happens, you need to do what many others are doing called Blue Water Climate Control Read their reviews, and you'll see story after story. Other companies tried to fix it, but Blue Water finally did. Call the guys who do it the right, do the right repair the right way the first time. Blue Water Climate Control. That's two nine nine twenty two ninety. Guys, welcome back to the Mailbag Podcast on this Thursday morning. Lots of solid questions. We'll start with this one. There was lots of coverage of the support staff with the last administration because Pruitt added as many as people as he could from Alabama. What does the support staff look like currently with numbers, duties, personnel compared to the last administration? Any holdovers? There are no holdovers. Everybody's gone from the last the last staff. Um, the only guy that you could maybe consider a holdover would be Kevin Simon. He's still in the building over there, but doesn't do a whole lot with football per se as far as, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, it's more off the field type stuff. Um, as far as support staff, I mean, you look at the recruiting office, you know, you've got Brandon Lawson, Scott Altizer, Trey Johnson, Charlie High, um, you know, uh, the, the defensive quality control uh, uh, coach uh, for the defensive line. Eric, you saw him out at the camp. He came with Coach Garner from Auburn. Um, so those two have worked hand in hand for a long time. And Rob, as we all know, so much of the continuity really helps the staff. So being able to bring in, you know, guys that you've worked with before, goes a long way to success uh, both on and off the field. Yeah, it speeds up the transition for sure. And then, I mean, in the fact, I mean, how many, how many years did, did Altizer and Lawson work together? I mean, several. And, you know, even beyond that, you know, Scott and, and Brendan both, I, I'm sure, still have contacts in the, in the Thornton Center. I mean, you know, behind the scenes stuff, not necessarily in the football program, but are still, you know, in, important areas where you have to have liaisons and relationships with, with other parts of the infrastructure on campus that aren't, you know, directly on the third or the second floor of the Mainland Thompson Sports Complex. All right. Can you guys go over the recruits, uh, what the recruits do during an official visit at summer camp versus during the fall? Do recruits officially visiting in the fall still work out or go through drills in front of the coaches? official no. visitors are not allowed to work out for coaches that 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 is that is a rule um you know now like so like this weekend so like coming up tomorrow like Jalen Glover and or you know you know Tolan cannot work out Eric you know they mm -hmm. they can watch camp whereas like anybody that's coming in for camp whether it be like Elijah Herring Caleb Herring or whoever they can work out at camp as unofficial visitors yeah, exactly. And you and, saw. I mean, they're also not getting their. I was, gonna I was say, just going to say, Eric. I'm sorry. I mean, they're not getting they're not getting their meals paid for, their hotel rooms paid for, their travel paid for. You know that important distinction if they're coming to camp. Yeah, and you saw some of that on Tuesday with with guys coming in camping uh, in front of these coaches, going through some drills and some getting offers thereafter. You saw uh, Kenzie Ball come in unofficially. He didn't work out, but uh, nonetheless, he was on campus and, and could have done so. But if you're on campus as an official with the perks of getting everything paid for to get you on campus and, and stuff like that, then uh, you, you can't uh, go through any type of workout with the coaches. As for the difference between summer OVs and fall OVs, biggest difference is you can't be here for a game. You know, outside of that, I mean, they're going to go eat the same restaurants. They're going to go and, and do the same tours and all that stuff and, and get the breakfast with high on Sunday morning. And just like every other official visit across America, but you don't get to be here for a game. So it's just different. So trying to simulate, you know, a sporting event is hard. With that said, Tennessee does get these first two weeks, providing Tennessee can take care of business on the baseball field coming up this weekend. The first two weekends, there'll be a sporting event on campus during the month of June, which, again, while it's a smaller dose of what Neyland could be, it's still a chance to, um, you know, showcase the fans in front of uh, – you know, the official visitors, There's only two this weekend, you know, DeMario Tolan and, and Jalen Glover more next weekend. Um, and, and we'll get, we'll get you ready for that next week. But, you know, the biggest difference really is just, you know, being able to be here for, for in a game. And, and, and to me, you know, coming to a game, 
guys, it, 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 that's where it really sets it apart because it's just different. You get that atmosphere. You get to, you know, sit and talk with some of the players that are on campus, some of the other you know, fellow recruits that are on campus, maybe going through official visits. You mentioned only two this weekend, but you kind of get to see what it would be like to be a student athlete, not necessarily going to a football game, but going to what you would be in a basketball game in the winter, but this time being a baseball environment. And this is going to be such an, an awesome, ruckus environment here for the regionals. It's going to be a packed house. More seating is in uh, town and is in Lindsay Nelson Stadium for this weekend as well. And so uh, this is a really good situation for these, these official visits. And if Tennessee makes it the Super Regional, likely will be, will be the case again next weekend. All right, Rob. Roba22 wants to know, what is the offseason, quote, May and June workday lives – for you all, are you calling or texting recruits, researching players, going to camps, writing future stories, playing golf? Check. Uh, we know this time of year gets <laughs> slow. So what do you guys do to fill it? And as always, thanks for everything you do for us. Uh, yeah, it, it, just, it just varies. Each each guy, each, each, you know, Rob, this is a slower month for you per se compared to recruiting for me because there's just not as much going on in basketball, whereas March is, you know, more of a slow, February, March is a slower month for me, whereas it's very busy for you. Yeah, very, I mean, certainly no chip in, help, help out with, help, help you out with camps when, when you need it, help out with con recruits when you need it. And in a normal year, which, you know, maybe that will be, I don't, it's not, not the case right now, even though NCAA has opened things back up, there'll be several big, like basketball events I would go to in June, always yeah. one at, at, at Charlottesville at University of Virginia that's that's stocked and then usually you know hit, hit one big one and um there's always you know either under armor or nike is playing a huge event at that new facility in, in um right outside Georgia. cartersville lake yeah, yeah. lake point which is always a, a great way to go spend two days and you know see you know 10 12 kids and and talk to them but um for me may early june lots lots of fly fishing i don't blame you lots, lots of, of chasing trout when I can get out there. Also, Roba22 guy says, uh, guys, hopefully with 100% capacity back at Needlin along with tailgating and everything that comes with it, what is something Danny White can or should do to make football game day uh, a better experience for the fans? Improvements to Needlin, parking, activities, et cetera. What do you guys say? I mean, it's not going to happen this fall, but I mean, I, I think down the road, you really got to do enhanced dealer and i'm talking about the concourses i mean i think some of that is is looking really dated really claustrophobic compared to you know some of the show pieces that, that you're seeing around this league especially yeah, i think it's going to be a couple of years in the making you know, this fall you might see more of a you know more tailgates more things around neyland stadium when you're getting there and kind of the environment outside i know that's Obviously, updates in England Stadium. That's, you know, hopefully coming in the future, and that's plans down the road that's not going to be here right now. But, uh, you know, other stuff going into England Stadium to enhance the game day experience, stuff on the Jumbotron, stuff to do during timeouts, stuff to do not necessarily like what you see in a, in a Major League Baseball game, per se, but maybe a little flair like that. But I think you'll see a little bit this fall and more as, as obviously, Danny White gets his, his bearings under him and as you have time to raise some funds and move on. This from... Ball since 1996. Uh, will this staff use D Beck with more than just at running back? I hope so. Um, I think D Beck was really impressed in spring with his ability to run with the ball. His pad level, I thought D Beck would be running straight up because he's so tall, but I liked his pad level, especially in that open practice, you know, going into the, the goal line and that 11 on 11 set. Um, I think he impressed the running back. I think that's, you know, from all, you know, I know about it, I think he gets where he's going to start camp, but. With as creative as Josh Heupel is and Alex Golish, you hope that you can maybe put him out there in the slot, throw in the football, just find ways to get him to the football as he continues to progress because he's certainly athletic enough to be a more than just a one-position type player if you're going to keep him at running back. Rob, this is from Deshaun13. Can a successful baseball program support itself financially? You know, that's a great question. That's something that I was actually – have been thinking about writing about because I, mean, I, I think – I don't know that one can necessarily support itself with Tennessee's stadium capacity um, being what it is, but I'm, I'm interested and I'm actually had made a note this week to, to find this out. How much of an injection has the SEC network televising these games provided these programs? I mean, the is it, you know, is it going to baseball specifically or is that just included in the check that's getting cut to, to the athletic department 
in general when they divide the funds up. But, you know, that's that's turned into, um, you know, an incredible amount of, of content for the SEC network. When you're talking about Thursday through Sunday and the quality of baseball in this league. And, I mean, Tennessee fans are just now warming up to it. I mean, they haven't had any, anything to cheer for for a long time. But, I mean, the interest level of places like LSU, Mississippi State, you know, Ole Miss, I mean, that's been in place for a long time. And I am, um, you know – that's an, a short answer is I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm interested in finding out and we'll try to do so here. Eric, you may know, I mean, you, you follow it closer than I do. Yeah. I mean, not, not much more than, you know, kind of what you added right there. I, I don't have a, a perfect way to answer that, but as, as Tennessee baseball continues, I mean, it's, it's getting better. It's a top five program nationally. And is it, you see it to be more consistently relevant in the top half of the, of the SEC and not only the top half of the top four, kind of where it is right now, you continue to see players or fans, you know, pack out the stands at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. If you finally get some plans in place to upgrade those facilities, those are going to be long-term payoffs, in my my opinion. But it's about consistency, and it, it's been a it's been a rise since Tony vitello has been here, no doubt. But now that you kind of arrived and and being a, a a host regional and and probably going to be hosting a super regional if you make it out of this weekend, um, consistency like that is only going to you know funnel in more funds down the road for for the Tennessee baseball program this from pine mountain bowl what is the most important game on the tennessee football schedule i'll go pittsburgh you win I'm that one. the same way you're, you're going to be three and oh going to florida not that that gives you any kind of edge to beat the gators but it does give you a a kind of a jolt there as you head to gainesville well, against man. the gators i think i mean it's a sad comment on kind of you know how far the program was falling but i completely agree ap because that that pretty much locks you into four wins. And if you can just find some way to, you know, get by Vanderbilt, South Carolina, I mean, two teams that, that are, that should be in pretty sorry shape or, you know, maybe Kentucky. I mean, you, it opens up the pathway to six and six, pretty making that pretty realistic. Say you do drop that game against Pittsburgh. And then, you know, I think it's, you know, you, you look at the early lines right now, Tennessee two and a half point favorite, you know, essentially a pick them because it's going to be the home team. But say you do lose that game against Pittsburgh. How big is that game against Missouri? It's at Missouri. That offense under Eli Drinkwitz and quarterback uh, Connor Bazelak is continuing to improve, overachieved last year. I think it's a football team on its way, not contending for an East title, but you're at Missouri on the road. That's one of those swing games, in my opinion, right now that Tennessee's not going to be favored in, but you could maybe steal. So if you could steal a game of Missouri to where you drop one against Ole Miss, that would be huge. You drop one against Pittsburgh. I like that Missouri because you have the potential to start out the season, what, uh, five and one? Yeah, five and one, and then heading to South Carolina. I think that'd be huge. This from Matt3128. Anything new with the Wade twins? No. I don't think there's been any contact uh, with the Wades. Uh, and I think that's been somewhat by design. I think Tennessee's been kind of letting that one breed. And, uh, you know, obviously, Clink Scale, who recruited them uh, as their primary recruiter, is now at Michigan. So, you know, uh, we'll see how that uh, affects them. But I, I, I think that contact is coming, I think. But to this point, there really hadn't been any. And I think, again, that's been by design. This from also from Pine Mountain Bowl. What does a day slash practice look like for a player during summer? How much time can they spend with coaches, football, and basketball? any player led one-on-one -on -one or seven-on-seven -seven practices happening. Uh, they work out with the, uh, the, on the football side, I'll start with them. Then we'll go to Rob for basketball on the football side. They, they spend, you know, they work out in kind of groups. Um, you know, when we were over there for camp the other day, you had, you know, like a 8 a.m. wave then a 10 30 a.m. wave. And, you know, you, you kind of go from there and um, you know, yeah, there are seven-on-seven -seven practices happening. As far as basketball, it's a little different, Rob. Um, you yeah, know. and this and this changed. I can't remember how many years ago, but it's in the not 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 so long ago. I mean, there was and coaches hated it. They couldn't be with the kids in the gym in the summer. And I guess within within the past decade, that rule has changed. And now, guys, this counts conditioning and weight training. Um, they can work with coaches eight hours a week for eight weeks during the summer. And you know, the different staffs bust that up different ways but once summer school started you got eight weeks where you can work with them eight hours a day but only two hours of that per week can be hands-on skill work with the coaches and there's no five on five stuff I mean the players get together and play pick up I mean literally every every day every night when when all 13 you know when, when the whole team is in place but as far as 
hands-on John Fulkerson working with, with Rick Barnes on, on, you know, adding something to his game. He gets two hours of that per week. Yeah, and as far as the players uh, on, on the football side, I, I'm sure there's a lot of player-led, seven-on-sevens, player-led, one-on-ones. All that stuff is scripted, and you got the coaches looking out their windows, okay? So they can't, if they're not out there, because obviously you can't be out there uh, in terms of the hours and all that during the summer, it's all scripted and they're all watching. Um, and, and, you know, that that's from my experience, and I would say that's, you know, the same all the way up, but uh, scripted, but that, that stuff's definitely going on. This is from Ball since 1996. In the SEC, we know the game is won at the line of scrimmage. Which do you guys or which do you guys think is better suited at Tennessee camp this coming year? Which is better, the O line or the D line? I don't think it's close. Do you guys? I mean, I'm I'm offensive no. line all the way. Yeah, I I would agree as well. I think you have you've got numbers, you've got guys, you got a lot of experience on the defensive line, but. And what have you done lately? And a lot of that's not really their fault, not trying to make excuses. But when you have three different you know, position coaches, now four in the span of a two-year span, it's, it's it's not great in terms of progression and development. But the offensive line, I think there's some players there. I think you've got a couple of nice guys that will not be starting, uh, but you feel really good about, about in terms of depth. Will it be a great unit? I don't think so, but I think it'll be solid nonetheless with the potential to be good up front with guys like Cade Mays and uh, you know Javante Spragans if he gets in there, Don Wright if he progresses, guys like that. I, mean, I bet you got I – mean, I'm not saying these guys will be stars or even starters, but I bet there's three or four guys on the offensive line that will be on the NFL rosters. I mean, Cade for sure. Yeah. And just just on size and measurables, I would say Calvert, Darnell Wright, well, you know, they, maybe not high draft picks, but they'll get mm-hmm. signed and have a chance. You know, it's early for Cooper, but he's a kid with a bright future. Spragans, who you just mentioned. I would say – again, I'm not saying anybody's – going to be a superstar, but there'll be a lot of guys on the offense, out of the offensive line room that get, get looks in the league. And Jerome Carvin's a guy that's been here a long time, but has you know kind of been banged up his entire career. He can play both guard spot. He can play center. I think he's a guy that, if healthy, will play a big role for Tennessee this year as well. This from four two three ball is Barry on Brown expected to visit anytime soon. He was at Florida this past week with Horton, who's expected to be here this weekend. Um, I've not heard Barry on as far as a uh, you know a locked in visit. Um, I know Tennessee wants to get him up here. Um, you know. That that recruitment, just I, I would expect it to have four thousand turns between now and when Barry on um, makes his announcement, uh, and then Volgrad 05, Rob is Coach K doing one more year going to cost us a basketball national championship? I think we would have gotten Banchero, and then I bet Jabari Smith comes to join up with Kennedy as well. If this had happened one year earlier, do you think the Vols win the Natty? Well, I don't. I mean, I don't think they first got to make a Final Four, Rob. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they were getting Jabari Smith and Benchero. I think that was, I think that was an either or. Those guys are very, very similar, and um, and I'm, you know, I don't. The only, the only freshmen that, that have come in, you know, since the one and done era, and, and really put a team on their back have been Anthony Davis, Carmelo Anthony, and I guess that Duke team a, a couple of years ago that, that beat Wisconsin. You might throw them in there. Jabari Parker. Jabari Parker. But, I mean, they, there were several of those guys. So, now, I mean, I'm not – I'm I'm out on thinking that, that you're going to, you know, sign five five-star freshmen and win the national championship. I mean, maybe if you if one of those five stars is Anthony Davis, yes. But those – they don't come around very often. I, I think I think what you saw from Baylor last year is, is kind of the blueprint. Veterans and sprinkle in the occasional one of duns. So, no, I don't think that cost them a national championship. Yeah, I mean, it's, if, if this last year didn't teach us anything, um, you have all the talent in the world, but it's about, you know, figuring out a way to, to play together and finding your groove. And, I mean, Keon Johnson's going to be a lottery pick, and obviously Springer was fantastic. And you had E. Pons. He was injured a little bit as well. You had so much talent on the roster, but now looking ahead – and I would advise people not to get their hopes up again, looking back at last year as an example, but you have more of a complete basketball team on paper now, but you still got to come together and progress and develop. And so um, I, that's just kind of the way I look at it in terms of that Duke team back in 2015 they had eight players on the roster. They had to d- dismiss one player, eight guys in the rotation, four of which were freshmen. That was the Okafor, the Winslow. Yeah, Joel the, Okafor. Yeah, yeah, not Parker. Parker. Good, good, good yeah. catch. Um, and then that was also the year that you had – Grayson Allen, who didn't play hardly at all in the regular season, go off in the Final Four. So sometimes you just need a magical run like that, and it obviously doesn't happen every single year. 
Well, so much of it is just getting hot at the right time. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that, you know, that same way with Tennessee baseball, you know, I mean, they're going to, you know, you get hot at the right time or, you know, if you have a slump, I mean, think about it going to this weekend, guys, Tennessee's baseball team is going to play right state. They can put up a lot of runs. Now that's been talked about a lot. Now we'll see how they do against, you know, Chad Dallas, who will likely be the game one, uh, first game started Friday night, but on the whole, like, you know, the, you could have just a bad weekend. All of a sudden, all the excitement just gets dashed and be and eliminated. At, so. And look at it this past year. I mean, the, the two best teams in the country, and it wasn't close, were Baylor and Gonzaga. And between them, they had one player, Jalen Suggs, that's one of them. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, most kids should return. I, I go back and I, I get why Keon left. I even get why Springer left. But at the same time, I think personally – Springer would have done himself more favors coming back to college. That's my opinion. Now, again, you don't turn down the money. I get that. But for his game, I think he would have improved more had he come back and played another year of college basketball. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think from the time he was a sophomore in high school. Oh, I get that, it. That, I, that was his plan for him and his family. Now, Keon, I don't think it, I don't think he, I don't think Keon and his family started thinking that way until maybe December of this year. I mean, I, I, I can promise you, I know for a fact that they didn't send him to Tennessee thinking he was going to be one and done. And uh, I, I think it kind of caught them by surprise, the position he ended up putting himself in. And, you know, like if you're going to be a top 10 pick, you, you, you got to go. I mean, Rick would have, Rick would have thrown him out the door if he had to, to take the money. I think Jaden could have played himself and Rob, you know, to, to tell me if, if you, you think differently. I think Jaden Springer obviously could have came back and, and played himself into a lottery pick if he returned and, and, and kind of went that route. But I feel like Keon Johnson, barring uh, some type of catastrophic injury, and again, that's that's the risk you take. If you're uh, you know, a slam dunk, high draft pick, you know, lottery pick, you're etched in there, and you come back, and uh, you, you know, as long as you play and you're healthy, you're going to be a lottery pick again. But what if you're not? Um, yeah, I, I feel like he would have been you know, that way either or, but yeah. uh, not, not surprised about either one of those guys. I think Jane could have helped himself. I think what it is with a lot of these kids, they know that they could probably improve their position. But the, the lure of getting to that second contract one year quicker is really big because that's where the money is. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Tobias Harris is going to make more I – mean, Tobias is a good player, but he's hardly a great player at All-Star. He's going to make more money than, than Peyton Manning did by the time he's done. I mean, he's yeah. signed well, two – Well, that's the NBA, though, too, and they're ridiculous contracts. Yeah, that's what I mean. But that's why yeah. they these kids want to get to that second contract a year quicker, which also means that they get to that third contract. A year quick. They get, if you can get to the third contract before you're 30 years old and sign a big one, you're making – I mean, you, you're, you're probably going to bank like a quarter of a billion dollars in your career. Well, look, look at – I mean, look, here's the thing about Springer. Yeah, I, I do believe it, for his game he would have improved a lot, but he's such a tweener, Rob. How much was his stock really going to improve? Yeah, unless he I, really just learned to – I mean, improved his shot to the point where he was just shooting the eyeballs out from three-point range. And, or a flip side, improved his handle and you know quickness to the point where he was more of a point guard than, as you're talking about right now, a combo guard, a tweener. Then yeah, I, I think if he goes and goes in the twenties, it's he's going to be totally fine with that. Well, guys, we appreciate the time. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have the uh, of the war room. We'll uh, have uh, Outkick 360. Brent Hubs will be back. Um, Coming up this weekend, he'll be part of our camp coverage along with Rob and Eric over there. And then Ben and Ryan will have the baseball coverage coming up Friday as well from Lindsey Nelson Stadium and the baseball regionals. Sadly, AP, I, I don't think Brent's bringing the beard back when he, when he returns. No, he's not. He's just uh, – we're, we're just glad he's coming back. It's, it's been a cooler week of the uh, – you know, for his vacation. So he's, he's not been real thrilled. This is a guy that doesn't like it when it's under uh, 85 degrees. <laughs> Let's get an alligator blow. For Eric Kane and Rob Lewis, I'm Austin Price. Thanks for listening to the VolQuest.com mailbag podcast. <laughs>